want to talk with you and discuss with you the question that unlocks gratitude. The question that unlocks gratitude. Before we go on, I think it's proper that we first define gratitude so we're all on the same page. From the Oxford languages, gratitude is defined as a noun, the quality of being thankful, the quality of being thankful, readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. That's loaded. It's more than just a feeling. It may be a noun, but it produces action. Gratitude always produces action. No one is born grateful. Let's, not, let's, let's get this clear up front. No one's born grateful. You see it on Christmas morning when those little darlings rip open the packages and they get a gift that you spent your time, money, fighting crowds to get. They rip it open. It is not exactly what they want and they toss it to the side. And then the parent always says, say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you know what? In that regard, many times we never grow up. We do the same thing. I've got a bunch of guitars. And my buddy Kim Deardorff, he, he knows that, uh, you know, I'll find a guitar and say, oh, man. Wow. He said, but didn't you really feel the same way about the other one? <laughs> I forgot that I should be grateful for the ones I have. And we do that in relationships. We go on over time and, you know, you had the, you know, the flutters in the stomach and uh, you look forward to, you hung on every word. Like I like to say, I say all the time, when, when Glennis and I first started dating, she would say, mm, look at him. Now she says, mm, look at him. <laughs> Sometimes it said the thrill is gone. It's not the thrill. Sometimes it's just the gratitude. <laughs> the gratitude is gone. But there is a question that will unlock gratitude. We'll talk about it in just a bit. Luke 17. We're going to spend a good portion of our time this morning in Luke 17. So if you want to turn there. Jesus taught them a lesson about gratitude. In Luke 17 verse 3, Jesus said, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him, verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. You all can, let you, you can breathe now. You can swallow because there's not near one of us in here who has done that perfectly. No, they're one of us. So Jesus said, be on your guard. <clears throat> for, for what was Jesus warning the apostles to be on their guard? Ungratefulness. What is ungratefulness? The quality of not being thankful and unwilling to show appreciation for and to return kindness. So he said, be on your guard. Now, he didn't say just forgive people willy-nilly. Remember, he says, if he repents, forgive him. And they come to you, I'm so sorry. For example, if your wife is trying to sleep and you come through the door like a bull in a china shop and she turns around and says, can you please try to show a little courtesy as I show you? And you say, I repent. She's obligated to forgive me. I mean, she's obligated to forgive him. <laughs> but we, we forget many times to do that. Isn't that right? So the, the apostles' ungratefulness was revealed by their next statement. Remember he said, forgive, forgive them, rebuke, and forgive. So they showed how ungrateful they were in verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now that would sound like a normal response, right? But what they were saying is, 
Well, we would if you gave us more of what was necessary to do it. In other words, the reason why we don't do it is because it's your fault, right? That's what they were saying. So sometimes we'll say things that sound very pious and very religious. In reality, we're just giving ourselves an excuse for not doing what we're supposed to do. Jesus knew their request was nothing more than an excuse. How do we know this? We must remember the context. He said, be aware of your ungratefulness. That's what he was saying early on. Beware of being ungrateful. Let's look at verse six. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. How many times have you heard this passage being used out of context. Jesus was not teaching them the power of their words. He was not saying to them that if your faith, if you have confidence in your confidence, you can do this. You see, this is what happens when you have faith in faith. Faith in faith is having confidence in your ability to do something. And that's what a lot of faith preachers teach. Oh, if you had enough faith, that sickness would go. And then you still have the sickness. What happens? You start doubting your faith. You see, the object of faith is not faith. The object of faith is God. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. He is able to do the impossible. So in other words, he says, if you had faith in me, in me as a mustard seed, just the littlest of faith, if you have the size of a mustard seed, you will be able to do that which seems impossible. That's what he was telling them in the context. But I'm sure somewhere in America, some preachers going around and saying, ha, bless God, and you can speak to that mountain. You can speak to that mulberry tree. You can speak to your wallet. And by the time you get it, after you give me a check, you're going to have everything you need. Bless God. Hallelujah. That's what they do. That's what they do. It's a con. It's a con. And then you go, there is, when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. So if someone is preaching something and you feel yourself getting twisted into a knot, you know it's not the truth because if you abide in my word and my word abides in you, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus then asked them a series of questions to expose the fallacy of their thinking, to expose their ungratefulness. Verse 7. Which of you having a slave or doulos? Many translations say servant. In the King James, and many of them, they didn't want to use that word slave because of the negative connotation. But the word is doulos, meaning one who gives himself up to another's will. Which of you having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? It's easy to read this verse and to think of someone else. We think of a slave. That's not me. I'm here to tell you I'm about to get me a do lost shirt, a do lost t shirt. So the world will know I'm a slave. Oh, Danny, you can't say that. What about America? I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about I once was a slave to unrighteousness. Now I am a slave to righteousness. Hallelujah. You're going to be a slave to somebody or something. I thank God that Jesus Christ bought you and bought me. And now we are slaves. We have what? We have given ourselves up to his will. Do loss. Say that with me. Do loss. Dulos. What's your name? Dulos. I don't care what it is. Dulos. Dulos is your name. 
do loss is who you are, and we praise God because we all a bunch of do losses up in here. Amen. Uh, verse 8. So considering that he said, you're not going to have him tell him to come sit down and eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterward, you may eat and drink. He asking a bunch of questions. See, Jesus asked questions not to gain information, but to expose foolishness. Remember, they said, oh, increase, our faith. increase your faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, in other words, he's saying it don't take great faith to do what I tell you to do. So he's continuing to ask the question. He said, will, will, will a do loss be invited to eat or will he be told to, OK, now that you finish out in the field, clean yourself up and serve me while I eat a drink. And then after you, you may eat a drink. Verse nine. He, meaning the master, does not thank the slave. Why? Because he did the things which are commanded. Does he? This is tough. Because we know that we are friends of God. We know that we are the children of God. We know we are the righteousness of God. But we rarely think of ourselves as slaves. If we don't ever think of ourselves as such, we will get what they call big-headed. We get puffed up. We don't know our place. We start thinking we're just like God, and we start thinking God owes us something. He's saying that the master has no obligation to say thank you to the slave. Remember the context. He said, beware of ungratefulness. God has shown mercy, has he not? And so he's saying we have an obligation to show mercy with no expectation of being thanked for doing it. That's rough. Folk don't want to hear that because huh, he owes me. She did this to me. He did this to me. He owes me. No, he doesn't. We owe God. We owe God that we show mercy. We pay the debt that we owe to him. Amen. So are we owed thanks from God when we do what he has commanded us to do? No. Well, let that sink for a minute. He doesn't say thank you. But, but we hear, we hear. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We hear, we know that in Hebrews it says that, that without faith it is impossible to please God. For you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? We know that we're going to receive rewards. But here's the key. There's ne'er a reward that we deserve. Nothing. So we're not old thanks. Verse 10. So you too do loss. When you do all the things which are commanded, you say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Okay, my class of do losses. Let us read the yellow out loud together, shall we? Instead of saying we, say I. Okay, shall we? I am un an unworthy slave. I have done only that which I ought to have done. Changes your mindset, doesn't it? God's not gonna say thank you. What are you supposed to do? Now, I know it is popular to reward children for doing the things which they ought to do. Unfortunately, or fortunately, how you look at it, I was not one of those. If I got an A at school, I got nothing. If I cleaned my room, I got nothing. Why? I already had room and board, and I was paying for nothing. Amen. That's a whole nother sermon. You don't pay people for doing what they're supposed to do, especially when you're taking care of all of their needs. Right? <laughs> you see, we stop, the little tight start thinking they're special. I knew I was loved 
But I just feel especially, I just feel especially special. <laughs> Whew, that's a tongue twister. I even asked dad, dad, why does mom get everything she wants and we don't? And he looked at us and said, because you're leaving. Took care of that? You're leaving. And when you go, I'm still going to have to live with her. So, you're not going to get everything you want. But you're sure enough going to have everything you need. But this one, she's going to get everything she wants. Why? Because she's me. Amen. Now, you got to go and find your me. <laughs> I praise God I found her. So we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. We have to remember that. We are not our own. We don't belong to ourselves. Our wills are no longer our wills. We submit to the will of God. He is sovereign, as Obi talked about earlier. He said that he is sovereign. God's will is our will. Lord, your will is my pleasure. That's the way we live. I'm a doulos. Once we were slaves to sin. I once was lost. But now I'm a slave to righteousness. I was found and now I see the beauty of Jesus Christ and following him and obeying him. I've learned what it means to trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to, to trust and obey. Now this brings us to the question that unlocks gratitude. Here it is. What does God owe me? Thank you. Nothing. I don't care what part of the country you're in, you may say nothing, nada, nothing. So what do I owe God? Everything. Excuse me, everything. And we're going to spend the rest of the time discussing why. He said, the master does not say to the slave, thank you for doing the things I commanded you to do. God owes me nothing, absolutely nothing. And once I realize that, I stop complaining. Why do we grumble and complain? Because we think God owes us something. Well, I don't like these people over there. Lord, they treat me. You, I deserve better than that. No, you don't. No, I don't. Because I haven't learned to be merciful wherever I am. Amen. God is going to discipline us so that we represent him and that we respond as Jesus responded. I'm here to tell you, the longer you, say, the longer you stay in a jacked up situation, the longer God is teaching you something. <laughs> that's why that's jacked up. But he's teaching you something. And what is he doing? He's putting you in that trial so that you will know that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt you belong to him. Because eventually what's going to, you're going to stop complaining and start praying. You can't pray for someone you hate. You can't truly pray for someone and hate them at the same time. I'm going to try that one again. You cannot truly pray from your heart for someone you hate. That's why you keep praying, keep praying so that the mercy of God will flow from your heart. So you're praying for their salvation, not for their damnation. So why? Why do, why do we owe God everything? First Peter 1 Peter 1.1. Verse 3, we know this, but we're going we're gonna to unpack it real good this morning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Who because he owes us. Isn't that what it says? No. Oh, oh, oh. Because of his great mercy. So what is the definition of mercy in the Greek? The outward manifestation of pity. It assumes need on the part of him who receives it. And resources, this is the good part, and resources 
adequate to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. God's resources are unlimited. Isn't that right? So when he shows mercy, he shows it with no limit. He gives you everything you need right then, right there. The gospel is not drip, drip, drip. You are saved not in drip, drip, drip. It is a washing of the word of God. And you are subtly changed in your spirit and in your soul. How do you know that? Because in the last day, at, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the very way you were changed when you were saved, your spirit and your soul was changed like that. Your body is going to be changed like that. It doesn't take God long to do what he purposes to do. Again, verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, what has he done? Has caused us to be born again to a living hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is really a continuation of our lesson last week. What happened because of what happened? Because of what happened at Calvary and what happened when he rose from the grave, we have faith in that. And God has shown you, you, mercy. How did he show mercy? He gave you the gift of faith whereby you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you have been saved and you will forever be saved. Amen. Hmm. It don't get no better than that. That's good. That's good. That, that's mm -mm, mm -mm, mm, good. That's, that's tasty. Does God owe mercy to anyone? Does he owe mercy? Mercy does not exist apart from justice. There is no mercy if there is no justice. We worked for just everyone who goes to hell. Worked for it. And gets exactly what they deserve. The wages of sin is what? The wages. God owes every sinner his justice. But the gift of God is eternal life. He owes no one mercy. He owes them because, why? They work for it. They built up, he even told Israel, look, don't destroy them yet. They haven't come to the fullness of their iniquity. Everyone who goes to hell gets exactly what they deserve. Everyone who goes to heaven will get exactly what they don't deserve. Amen. So he doesn't know, there is not going to be one person in heaven walking around, going around and saying, bless God, I deserve this. Y'all don't, don't understand. I work hard for God. Yeah. No, see, the one that talks like that, he's going to say, depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew you. If mercy is ever old, it's no longer mercy. So think about that. Has God shown you mercy? What does that squeeze out of you? What does that unlock? Gratitude. The one question, the one question that unlocks gratitude. What does God owe me? Verse 4, 1 Peter 1. He calls us to believe in a resurrection. For what purpose? To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Oh, happy day. Reserved in heaven for you, verse 5, you who? Who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What is the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time? Our new bodies, the redemption of our body. Has he already given you everything you need? What, what, what does God owe us? Nothing. 
Just pause and think about that. Think about that thing you've been complaining about. I did not want to have all of this going on in my sinuses. I got things to do. I, uh, I'm a busy man. I can complain. Lord, you know. Mm -mm. Lord, you owe me absolutely nothing. And because of that, I'm going to give you everything, even when I don't feel like it. So let's review. Because of God's mercy, we have been born again into a living hope, saved through faith, not of ourselves, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through faith, we've been saved in the resurrection, guaranteed an eternal inheritance, and are protected by God through the gift of faith until we receive our glorified bodies. The next time, as we like to say, the next time you want to fix your face to start complaining, remember that. Remember that. I remember this, <laughs> Glenn is saying to the kid, you better fix your face. The next time I start complaining, I'm going to fix my face and realize, God, you owe me nothing. But, but I want to, Lord, you owe me nothing. But my, my body hurts. Lord, you owe me nothing. But you've given me everything. And therefore, I'm thankful. And we ought to give thanks. We have been equipped. To do good deeds. Why? Because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We do the good works. not because We do it because we owe him. We don't do it so we put God in debt. That will never happen. The proof that we are grateful for the mercy of God is the extent to which we show mercy to those who deserve it the least. I got an F on that. You just, just, I ain't showing you my report card. Nope. That's between me and God. But thank God that he gives us time and that he allows us to see the error of our ways. The worst thing that can happen is you keep doing the same thing and you can't see that what you're doing is wrong. But by the Spirit of God, we see that, we, Lord, we confess. Lord, I agree with what you say about this, and I repent. Lord, I want to repent, and I truly repent. But then six, seven, eight days, seven, eight months later, I find myself doing the same thing. What do we do? We repent. How many times has God forgiven you? How many times? Ha, ha, I don't shout me down. How many times has God forgiven you? You stop counting. You don't have enough toes. You don't have enough fingers. You don't have a big enough calculator to figure out how many times he's forgiven you. So how many times should we forgive those who come to us and saying, I repent? Amen. In this, you greatly rejoice, filled with gratitude for what he has already done and promised. Amen. Even though now for a little while, if, nece if necessary, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. When is it necessary for me to go to a trial? What? It's necessary when I refuse to show mercy to other people as God has been merciful to me. It's necessary. Verse 7. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in what praise? Declaring his gratitude, our gratitude and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We will praise him, Lord, I went through trials, but through every trial, you showed me that my faith was genuine. Why? Because I learned to forgive. I learned to show mercy. And through it all, I trusted you. God knows you're saved, but you need to know you're saved. That's the purpose of the trial. So you know you're saved, and I know I'm saved. And how do we know? Because we don't act a monkey when we go through things. Amen. When God gives us our rewards in heaven, we will praise him because we will know the rewards are undeserved. Lord, I don't deserve this. It's only because of your goodness. What will we say, Lord? I'm just an unworthy slave. I've only done the thing which you commanded me to do. And when he puts that crown on your head and he gives you that role and he takes you by the hand and leads you through the promised land, what a day of gratitude 
that will be. Gratitude. God owes me nothing. Yet he has given me everything. Verse 8. First Peter 1, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Why? Because he owes you nothing that's giving you everything. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You are being delivered from selfishness. Every day you're being delivered from self. You're dying to self. When we believe God and when we forgive others, we're dying to ourselves and we're becoming more. More and more like Christ. I want to end in Romans chapter 11. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Jesse Duplantis. That man acts like a fool. Saying, God came to me and asked me, what would I do in this circumstance? What? I'm telling you now, God is not going to ask you. He's not going to ask me. And he's sure not asking any of those shucksters on TV what he needs to do. Again, verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Verse 35. Or who has ever first given to him and has to be repaid? Nobody. He owes me nothing. Say that with me. God owes me nothing. Verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And the church said, Amen. Father God, we thank you. That by your grace, we understand you owe us nothing. We owe you everything. Lord, in the times when we're ungrateful, may we ask ourselves, what do you owe us? Nothing. But we owe you everything. And we, therefore, we <coughs> owe you in that we show gratitude and we show mercy and we show forgiveness in thanks for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Father, that you have made Christ our hope in life and death. Thank you, Lord, that we have the hope of heaven and that we live knowing that we belong to him. Though we have not seen him, we love him. And Lord, we thank you that we, can, we expect to see him and we will see him and he will reward us not because we deserve it, but because of his mercy. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.